different, um, but it's really cool. Um, so we're going to see how this works. I'm not used to this, so if, if my back's turned to you, I'm sorry. I'm going to try to figure it out. We're going to try to just move on about. But we're in this series called Only the Young. If you look up at the screen behind me or in front of me, I don't know, depending on what way I'm looking. Um, we're in this series called Only the Young. And we've been looking at tons of young characters in the Bible. We looked at David already. We've looked at Jeremiah. Last week, uh, we had the incredible opportunity to look at Esther. Um, and it was really cool because we got to look at Esther, who is a woman in the Bible who is very prominent. But we missed out on the fact that she was also very young. And the cool thing about it was the fact that we're in Women's History Month. If you guys didn't know that, it's actually finishing up tomorrow. And we get to close up with another incredible young woman named Rahab. How many of you guys have heard of Rahab before by a show of hands? All right, so a lot of no hands, which is a good thing, because you get to hear of a new and important Bible character. So I'm excited to get into that. Before I get into that, if you guys want to join me, we're just going to pray really quick. And then as we pray, we'll, we'll jump right into this message. I won't be up here long. God, we thank you for this incredible opportunity we have to come here and worship you uh, today. Uh, we thank you that even in this different setup, uh, the one thing that stays the same is you. Uh, it doesn't matter where it is that we set up or how it is that we set up. Your spirit can still move no matter what, God. And we thank you for that. So I pray that in this message that you've given to me, I pray that it's not just my words, my thoughts, but it's your truth shining through. Um, so that it's impactful to everyone's lives, myself included. Um, God, we love you and the same that we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So I'm going to give some quick background on uh, this kind of story before we get into the Rahab part of it all. So how many of you guys have heard of Moses? Hopefully you guys have heard of Moses before. If not, watch Prince of Egypt. It's a great movie, a great soundtrack. Go check it out. Um, but that tells you the full story of Moses. And Moses was this guy who got the Israelites out of Egypt. They went into the wilderness. Um, eventually, uh, there was this idea that they were going to get to the promised land, whatever that promised land looked like. Um, but a lot of people in Moses' time, they kind of just had all these doubts and had all these fears. So pretty much everyone who was around Moses' time, they all die. They all just, God was like, you guys don't get to see the promised land. You guys are just too fearful, too doubtful. You guys don't get that opportunity. But the younger generation, you guys get to. And we get to see Joshua take over because this book is in Joshua. And finally, Joshua's, or Joshua tells God that they can go into the promised land. But to do that, they send these spies, they send these scouters to look at what's ahead in the promised land. And that's where we pick up in Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Then Joshua, son of Nun, secretly sent two spies from Shittim, uh, going, go, go look over the land, especially Jericho. Uh, so they went and entered the house of a prostitute named Rahab, and they stayed there. Now let's sit and talk about this one verse. This is the heart of of the whole verse, and it's, I think it's incredible that this chapter starts off with that. So we get the introduction of our character for today, Rahab. Rahab is the character we're looking at, the character we're talking about, this young girl. We're not quite sure what her age is, um, but the one thing that is significant, and I hope you guys didn't miss it, is her, her job, her profession. She's, she's a prostitute. That's, that's, we, we, that's right. This is the person we're talking about. We're talking about a prostitute in the Bible. Right. And what's very interesting about her is, is where she's located also in this city. So she's a prostitute. Yes, the, the Bible is very clear on that. But the one thing about her location that we'll read about a little bit later is she's actually on the outside of the city of Jericho. She's on the, the far outer skirts of the city and she's actually a part of the wall. There's this big wall in Jericho. Maybe if you've heard the name Jericho, maybe it's kind of coming back to you as far as this wall that crumbles down. She's a part of that wall. And there's this woman who's at the edge of the city. And normally when you're at the edge of a city, that means one thing for most cities is there's a high possibility that you're poor. You think about like the middle of the city, there's usually like the castle. There's, if you think about like some fairy tale, the middle is where the castle is. The, missile, the, the, the middle is where all the rich people are. The middle is where all the money's at. But on the edge, is where all the people are who don't really got the money, who don't really have the resources. So when we look at her being a prostitute, the, the one thing, I and, and it's important, I, I'm going to keep saying it over and over because I don't want you guys to miss this, 
is the fact that sometimes we might feel like this is something she, she chose. Like she's this horrible person. Sometimes if you've heard this story in church, it kind of paints her out to have this picture. of There's this woman who chose this, this horrible life. But when you look at it, again, she was poor. And again, she was a part of this wall. So she's poor in probably a dangerous part of this city. I wonder if she's just doing this to survive. And I think that feeling of survival is something that a lot of us can relate to, of just trying to survive, just to, trying to get day by day. And I think that's the circumstance that she's in. We see someone who is truly just at a low, low place, and unfortunately, that's what she had to turn to. But at the same time, when we look at our own lives, sometimes we're just trying to survive. If we think about we're just trying to survive our family situations, or maybe it's, it's craziness at home, whether it's parents fighting all the time, or maybe you're fighting with your siblings, or whatever the situation is, we're just trying to survive, even at home. Maybe you can relate to that feeling, or maybe for you, it's mentally and emotionally. You wake up every day just afflicted with, with thoughts and, and all these different emotions that hurt your heart, hurt your mind, and you're just confused, and you're just trying to survive day to day. Survival is a thing that I think we can all relate to just as humans, especially when we look at the world around us. When we look at the crazy stuff that's going on in the news, there's this idea of can I just survive through this day? Can I survive in this location? Can I survive just in general? And that's what we truly see is this person who's trying to survive. And she's been trying to survive. And it's led her into a life of sin. But I don't want you to look at her as this evil person. Because Jesus and God doesn't look at her as this evil person. But let's see what goes on into the story. So kind of telling the, so the, the spies, they come to her house. And the king of Jericho finds out that the spies have come into the city. So they go to Rahab because they probably heard this, that's where the spies went. And they said, hey, Rahab, I know you got some spies in there. Let them out so we can handle them for you. And, and she does something interesting. And it's interesting because she lies. Like, she, 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 there's no sugarcoating it. She lies. And she says, oh, yeah, they were here, but they left. And if you leave right now, you can go catch them. And they go. But the truth is, they're actually upstairs, and she has them hidden. Hidden from, from these people, hidden from the king, hidden from the, the people who are supposed to be on her side. Because truthfully, these spies did come to take away the land. So she's hiding the enemy. At least that's what it looks like. And it's, it's kind of confusing. And she lies. But we, we understand the heart behind that lie. Because I'm not saying she lied for a good reason. Lying is still a sin. But the heart behind it is what I think is most interesting. Now we're jumping back and read a couple of these verses, and we see the why behind her lie and why God possibly forgave her in that situation. So Joshua chapter 2, verse 9 and 11. If you guys want to look up at the screen, you guys can read that. If you guys are sitting right here, you got to, like, break your neck. Um, but you can still look up on the screen. Um, chapter, chapter 2, verse 9, this is what she said to the spies. She said, I know that the Lord has given you this land, and a great fear has fallen on us, so that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. In verse 10, we heard the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea of Egypt. We heard of the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan who you completely destroyed. We heard, we heard it and our hearts melted in fear. Everyone's courage failed because of you. For your Lord, your God is heaven, is, is God in heaven above and an earth below. So we see the heart behind it now. If she heard of this God, she heard of all the incredible things God was doing for these people. She heard of all the, the miracles that God was doing. Even we talked about, we just sung that song just not too long ago as far as how God can make a way. And she heard about all this incredible stuff that God did and left her with one point or one thing that she can do. And that's our first point for tonight is when we hear about what God did, this is my first point, is believe in what God has done. When, when we're in this faith, when we're in this place of we're just trying to survive, the first step is believing what God has done. Whether it's the, the stuff that we read about in the Bible or the stuff that we see in our lives, the stuff that he's got us through in the past, the stuff that he's gotten other people through in the past. Because that same God that did stuff in the past can still change and turn stuff around today. So it's important that we look at the things we can see in the Bible. It's important that we look at the things that God has done in other people's lives so we can begin to believe in all the different things that he can do for us now. But it starts first with looking back at what he's already done. 
And that's what we get to, to see in this story. She saw, she heard of all the incredible things that God did for the Israelites. And she began to believe that their God truly is this God. And in our lives, when we're just trying to survive, there's a lot of hope that can come from hearing about the incredible things God does in other people's lives, the incredible things God does in the Bible. And sometimes even looking back on our own lives and realizing God has gotten us through some stuff as well, too. So that's the first thing we see in this story. And she goes on to ask them, hey, so I believe in this God, and all I ask is I know you got to come here and destroy this land. I ask that you just save me. Just please, dear, the, the, the God that saved you, please allow him to save me and my family. And the spies have a very interesting response. And they tell her, yes, you, you, you saved us, so, so we're going to protect you. But it comes with some conditions. And, and they, they tell her, first and foremost, you have to bring all of your family into this place. Bring all of your family into this house first. That's the first step. And then after that, what we're going to ask you to do is once you let us go, you're, you're going to let us out of your house. And again, she's on the wall. The, there's going to be a red cord, a, a scarlet cord is what they call it in the Bible when we read the text. It's like this little rope that's red. Put it outside of your window. And when you put it outside of your window, and as long as you don't tell anything of what happened, anything of what we're going to do to anybody, you'll be safe. And in verse 21, we see her response. Um, and then we're not too long. I'll be up here a little bit longer. Um, in 21, after all of that, this is what she said in verse 21 in Joshua. She said, she said, agreed. Let it be as you say. So she agreed to it. But this is the important part. So they went away and they departed. She tied the scarlet cord in the window. And this brings me to the second point of today's teaching. Is faith in what God tells us to do. The, the, the first step is, is believing in what God has done already. What God has done in the Bible, what God has done in all these other people's lives. The belief part is what, what saves you, especially when we talk about salvation. Belief saves you, but faith kind of takes, a, takes it a step beyond that. Stay for, Faith requires us to do some work as well, too. Faith requires us to, to step out and actually do action. And we know that because there's actually this verse in, in James. And James is Jesus' brother, and he's talking about faith. And he actually uses, his, he uses Rahab as an example to explain how faith is something that requires action. In James chapter 2, verse 25 and 26, it says, In the same way was not Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did. Again, action. And then in verse 26, it says, as the body is without the spirit, so is faith. Sorry, as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. So it's this idea of if I were to bring Sean up here, I'm not going to do it right now because it's a small stage. But I say, hey, Sean, do you trust me? Yes? Verbal, I need a verbal answer. Yes? For sure? If not, I'm going to pick somebody else. Yes? All right. We're going to do a trust fall. You believe me, right? So if I were to do this trust fall with Sean, I mean, we're not going to do it because I don't know if he'll really fall back. But the faith part comes in when he actually falls back. If he just says, hey, I trust you, but then there's no action behind it, he don't really trust me. He, he's scared I'm going to drop him, right? And that's what faith is. Faith is the action part of that. Faith is, is the proof of the belief that we have. And she goes on to listen to them, and as she did, but... The interesting part of the story, if you know anything about the, the walls of, of Jericho and, and how that goes about is, is what happens is a couple days after that, she already sent them away, they come back. And in her mind, she's probably like, all right, cool, I'm about to be saved now. Yeah, I can see them, they're going to save me. I don't know what the situation is. But what's interesting, if you don't know the story, what happens is once a day, they march around the city. So imagine, once a day, she sees them pass by her house, because again, her house is a part of the wall. And every day, maybe she's thinking, oh, this is, this is when I'm going to be protected. This is when things are going to be good. This is when something's going to go down. Because she doesn't know the plan. And every day, she's still stuck in the same situation. Nothing changes yet. She's still stuck in that place where she's just trying to survive. And day after day after day, it's the same thing. And then on the seventh day, they pass by her house seven times. So I can imagine, I'm, I mean, if I was her, I can't speak for what it says because it's not in the Bible, but if I was her, I'd be like, yo, you keep passing my house, just pick me up before you attack, right? That's how I would respond. I don't know about you guys. But that's how I would respond. 
But no, what happens is after the seventh time, they blow these horns and they, they shout. It's like this super loud scream, this super loud shout. So I could only imagine the thoughts that are going through her head. It's like this loud battle cry. It's like, dang, did they forget about me? But I don't think that's what she had. I, don't, I think that's how I reacted. Like, oh, no, they forgot about me. They broke their promise. They're about to kill me right now. And what happens is when they shout, the walls begin to crumble. Now, remember, where's her house? In the wall. So I'm sure her house began to shake. Things weren't looking too good. But she still had to keep that faith. And she still had to keep that belief that what they said would happen. And that happened to be the case. The walls fell, but the only thing that was left standing was Rahab and her family. And she was safe. And when you read it at the end of that chapter, after the walls fall, in chapter 6, verse 25, it says, Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent to spy um, in Jericho. And then what the interesting part and the best part about this is she lived among the Israelites to this day. So not only did she survive, but now she was invited in to her enemies. She was invited in to the chosen people of God. She got the opportunity to live among them. And her faith truly became this legendary thing. It became this thing that people talked about for years and years and years, her faith of hiding these spies and, and lying to the king to protect them and, and truly trusting this whole process of knowing that God was going to get her through it. That her faith became legendary to the point where there's this book, uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. It's known as the Faith Hall of Fame. There's so many, like, heavy hitters in that. Like, if you think of a Hall of Fame, if you think about Hall of Fame of, like, basketball, you think of, like, Michael Jordan, or you think of, maybe you guys are young. So let's say, like, current Hall of Famers. There's, like, LeBron James. There's, like, Dwayne Wade. There's, like, all these incredible players in this Faith Hall of Fame. So in the Bible, that's, like, Noah from Noah's Ark. That's Moses. That's, that's Abraham. That's David, who he, he learned about in the first week of the series. There's all these Big names and included in that name or in that in that list is Rahab. And in in chapter in chapter eleven, verse thirty one, we see that it says, uh, "By the faith, the, by faith, the prostitute again, their prostitute, uh, because she welcomed the spies and was not killed with those who disobeyed." And another version that says, "With those who didn't believe." So we see where it's because of her faith she becomes legendary. And if that's not enough, the most interesting thing about Rahab and the most powerful thing about Rahab is what we see when we look at Jesus' genealogy. And in Matthew chapter 1, it, it goes through the whole family history of Jesus. It starts way back in Abraham and it just keeps going and going and going. And then in verse 5, we see something interesting. In verse 5, it says, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Let's stop there for a second. And Jesus' genealogy, his great, 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 if you keep going, his great grandma was a prostitute. And that's something that is so powerful and so important. Again, I don't want you guys to miss because you might be sitting here and feeling like you're not good enough to be a part of God's family. You're not good enough to be loved by God. You're not good enough to be used by God. You've messed up too much. Jesus' great-great-grandmother was a prostitute. So whatever mess up you think you've done that's too big, whatever mistake you think you've done that's too big, it's never bigger than the love that God has for you. So my last point, and I'm going to close out with this, is when we believe and have faith, God saves and he elevates. We, we think about Rahab. We think about her life. As a prostitute in this, this city, at the edge, living in these poor conditions, these dangerous conditions, I could only imagine the, how people used her and, and abused her for years. I could only imagine the, the danger that she was constantly in. I could only imagine the fear she was constantly in. But it's because of the belief she had in God and the faith she put in what he told her to do, she was saved. But not only was she saved, she was elevated to this legendary status where she's included alongside all these incredible Bible characters, these incredible Bible people who lived truly in this real world. She elevates 
to that status. And that's my challenge for you guys today. I want to ask you guys to bow your heads, and I want to pray two specific prayers. The first is for those who are sitting in this room, and, and maybe you've never had the opportunity to truly just sit there and believe in God. Believe in all the things that he's done. Believe in all the things that you've heard him do in other people's lives. You've, you maybe you've been skeptical and trying to wrestle with if this is something that's even real. And you, you're finally feeling this nudge of, I, I want to begin to believe. And, and here's the thing about belief. You don't have to fully understand to believe. But the belief part is what saves you. The belief part is the thing that saves you from the sins that you've done. The, that, that's what saves you. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that. So if that's you in this room and you've never had that opportunity to say, God, I, I'm choosing you and I'm believing in you. I want you to raise your hand and you could shoot it up and then put it down. Just because I want to see who I'm praying for. If that's you, I want you to pray. Then I want everybody to repeat after me and pray this prayer of just belief and just going to God. God, I, I choose today to believe in you. And God, I choose you because I know I can't save myself. God, I understand that I am a sinner. But God, I believe you sent your son to live the perfect life that I couldn't. And he would go on to die on the cross and take on my punishment. And God, I believe he would rise three days later, defeating death. So God, I ask that you help me learn to love you more every single day. And God, I give my life over to you. And God, I love you in your name that we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, that's the greatest prayer you ever pray in your life, I promise you. But I want to pray one more prayer, and then we'll, we'll go to groups. I want to pray for those people who are ready to, to take that faith step. Maybe you believed already. Maybe you've, you've come to church for all these years. You've had this opportunity to, to already accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But you're realizing you're not doing fully what he tells you to do. Because the thing about that part is that's what elevates you. That's what truly takes you out of the, the mess that you're in. That, that pit that you're in, the faith part gets you out of that. I'm not saying it's going to take away the situations. I'm not saying he's going to bless you with all this incredible stuff. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying there will be a joy, there will be a peace, there will be a hope that you walk with that is far greater than anything you're feeling right now. So I want to pray that for all of us, to just be obedient to that faith call, that that doing what God tells us to do and learning more about him and reading his word and, and coming to church and building godly relationships. I want to pray that God helps us all walk in our faith. So let's pray. God, I thank you for this opportunity we have to just learn about this incredible woman of Rahab. God, we, we thank you that even so young, God, we, we got the opportunity to learn from, from her struggle, learn from her situation of just surviving. And right now there's a lot of us in this room who are just trying to survive. God, survive the, the family stresses. We're trying to survive the school stresses. We're trying to survive the fears and the worries that we see as we look at the news or the fears and the worries that we just feel about ourselves. And God, I pray that in this moment you give us the, the opportunity to just truly walk out in faith what your word says about us, how that we're loved and, and how that we're worthy of being loved. And, and God, I pray that we, we learn to walk in that, God, we, I pray that you surround us with a community to face those fears head on, to face those worries head on, God. And I pray that you help us just grow in faith, grow in action in spreading your love and being the light that this world needs because it so desperately needs it, God. So, God, I pray that you help us just learn to just follow you and follow your word and follow your truth over anything. God, I love you and it's your precious name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.